I'd like to welcome you today to the Electrical and Computer Engineering Building at the University of Illinois. We're going to tour the facility and look at some of the interior and exterior features. I'm Professor Philip Krein, a faculty member in the department, and I was the chair of the user committee as we went through the design and construction of this facility. And my name is Cody Sandberg. I'm an architectural designer with Smith Group JJR, and I was the designer on the ECE building. From the project inception, energy efficiency was always the number one priority. The building is approximately 230,000 square foot, and it's composed of classrooms, laboratories, research laboratories, collaborative spaces, and offices. And upon arrival at the building, one of the first things you'll notice is that it looks a little bit different from the buildings around it. And that's because the ECE building has an envelope composed of a terracotta rain screen system. And this is one of the most important energy reduction features on the exterior shell of the building. Behind these terracotta panels are four inches of insulation. The building also has only 30% glazing or 30% glass on its exterior. The glass was strategically located in the most appropriate places uh, to get the optimal views and daylight into the building. Um, but to improve that energy efficiency, only 30% of the exterior is glass. And of that percentage of glazing, 80% of it is shielded by exterior solar shading devices, which are both the terracotta baguettes, which are horizontal sunscreen elements, or the south solar canopy. There's more to lead than just energy use. One of the sustainable features on this project is its abundant use of local and regional materials. For example, the granite on the building came from Minnesota, which was within a 500-mile radius, and it's a predominantly steel building, and as we all know, steel has a very high recycled and recyclable content. Another example of its sustainable features is the fact that the building has provided showers and changing rooms, which promotes bike usage. In addition, there is abundance of bike racks on the campus to promote as well. Water efficiency is an incredibly important part of the LEED system, and some of the exterior features that have been included here at ECE are permeable pavers, which allow water to trickle slowly into the ground to an underwater trench below, which retains storm water and releases it slowly back to the storm sewer system. This ensures that all of the rainwater that falls on the site is controlled at a manageable rate and doesn't overload public systems. Well, let's walk in the main entrance. You see the large lobby area. Now, as we walk into the lobby, off to our left is the Granger Auditorium. This is one of the larger instructional auditoriums on the campus, seating about 400 students. It's unusual in its energy features in two ways. First, it uses what's called a displacement ventilation system. And what this means is that low pressure, low volume air circulates up from the floor in fact, there's a vent under every single seat in the room. Keeps the air very fresh, close to the floor. And then there's kind of a general return at the ceiling. This system actually uses about 30% less energy than the more typical ventilation system. And at the same time, keeps the room far more comfortable and quite a bit less noisy than almost any other similar facility around. It's unusual for an auditorium like this to have three sides that are glass, so it can take advantage of daylighting, and there also are ways to adjust the rest of the lighting to accommodate that. Now, turning a little bit and looking in front of us, we see the nano lab. This is a, a very unusual, really a unique facility globally. This is an instructional laboratory on advanced processing for semiconductor devices. Actually, kind of beyond the state of the art, we're looking a couple of generations ahead to see all the things that we can do. And this one is typically a very high energy use area in any given building. Now, let's go up the grand lobby staircase to the second floor classrooms and take a look at some of the things going on up there. Cody, you want to talk about this staircase a little bit? 
Absolutely. This open staircase is what we call a collaborative stair or a connecting stair. It's open, so it allows this atrium lobby space to be both visually and physically connected to the second floor above. Um, and it also helps contribute to the use of stairs over elevators to move people through the building up these stairways and also offer those impromptu um, we like to call them intellectual collisions on the path to their destination. Okay, we've reached the second floor. In front of us is the support space for the nano lab. But let's go down the hall here to the south hall and look at some of the classrooms along the way. You'll notice that here is where a lot of the glass is in the building. And in particular, these windows here in the south hallway allow light to penetrate into the classrooms without imposing direct heat loads and direct sunlight into those learning spaces. We can see the landscaping looking out the window here in the south hallway. And all the landscaping was designed to be local indigenous plant material. And what this allows is no permanent irrigation system to sustain this plant life. All right, we're going down to the southwest staircase and we'll go up to the third floor. And we want to see some of the uh, spaces and classrooms up there as well. Let's go down this hallway we're headed toward a large multi-purpose room. It's known as the ballroom. And there are some special features related to the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and lighting that we'd like to point out. So I'd like to talk about the chilled beam system, which is the primary cooling strategy for all of the classroom, labs, lounge, corridors, etc. And chilled beams are a highly efficient means of cooling water as opposed to cooling air as it's forced through a building. And what this means is cool air is actually dropped from the ceiling mounted chilled beam devices and they allow the warm air in the room to drift up towards the ceiling. So that means where occupants are in the lower portion of the room, it's much cooler and more comfortable, um, and it's a very efficient a way to cool a space. One of the interesting aspects of this building is that it highlights a number of inventions and innovations that have been created over the years by our faculty, our alumni, and others associated with ECE Illinois. Above us, you're seeing solid-state lighting. All of the lights in this particular room are LED lights by a couple of different manufacturers. The visible LED was originally invented about 50 years ago by Nick Holenyak, who was a longtime faculty member in our department. And it certainly was very gratifying to him as the technology matured and now is beginning to replace more conventional lighting with high performance, low energy devices. Let's go out and we'll take a right. Uh, we're walking down a hall past one of the other classrooms. In front of us, you see a graduate student lounge. And then down the hall, as we turn left here, we'll see an undergraduate lounge space. Let's walk into the distance learning classroom. Teleconferencing, of course, is something that a lot of people have begun to emphasize. Certainly, it's a way to reduce energy costs of bringing people together. And yet, the technology continues to improve and enhance. This room is really intended to adapt to future technology as things improve, better displays, better interaction with the outside world. We use this room now for many different distance learning and teleconferencing activities and its uses will grow in the future as we get to the point where we have full wall displays and many other enhanced interaction. But the building itself is already full of interaction. You may have noticed a couple of the little room signs as we've walked past down the hall. These are active touch pads and have additional information such as schedules and other details of each particular facility available for users to see. In this room, there are many different sensors and lighting controls, and we would have seen those in the hallways and so forth as well. So occupancy sensors, all kinds of heating, ventilation, thermal sensors, and other features are helping us control the building. 
all of the lighting and mechanical systems in this building are operated on occupancy sensors to ensure that empty rooms are not using wasted energy on lighting or heating or cooling. And those also help us maintain air quality. So the building has air exchange devices that maintain fresh air with minimum possible thermal issues as we go back and forth. Certainly we don't want to be having to cool a lot of fresh air in the summertime or heat a lot of fresh air in the wintertime and throw that extra energy away. So heat exchange is very important as we do air exchange in the building. Now, we're going past the undergraduate student lounge and let's go up the staircase to the fourth floor. This floor includes several teaching labs and a research laboratory and a lot of office facilities as well for some of our faculty, similar to some of the floors below it. We have a very substantial solar installation on the building. Any zero net energy building needs to have an energy resource to be able to provide the necessary incoming requirements. The building doesn't operate entirely on its own. It is connected to the electricity grid. And the intent is that at least on the average over a year, it will produce at least as much energy as it consumes. One of the inventive things that we would find up here is the electronics that connect these solar panels to the grid are the invention of another one of our faculty members and indeed are one of the more practical ways to make a direct connection from a solar panel into the electricity grid. As we think about solar energy systems, people often ask about energy storage and how that might integrate into solar panels and solar energy use. This building actually interacts and is interconnected into the large campus cold water system, which actually has a large cooling tank as an energy storage mechanism on the south campus. It's linked to the supercomputing system that's there. But this building has a number of energy features that interact with that chilled water system and allow us to gain tremendous energy advantages over comparable buildings. The building's heat recovery chillers are the primary source of heating for the building and actually make cool, chilled water the waste byproduct, which is sold back to the campus during the winter months. So this system allows us to produce the heating water mechanism that we need to keep the building warm in the winter and use the campus chilled system as the storage and, and almost waste product. So essentially, the energy that we're using, that we're putting into the building to generate the heat is being pumped out of that chilled water system with a heat pump mechanism. But it gives us the ability to put that extra cold water back in when we have excess energy and becomes a virtual storage resource. This system is arguably one of the most energy optimizing systems in the building, and early models have shown that this heat recovery chiller contributes 23% of the energy savings as compared to an ASHRAE baseline building. Now, even though the building is very large, it's actually not possible in a structure this tall to put enough solar panels on it to fulfill all of the energy needs. And that's why on the nearby parking deck, we have a solar structure at the top that holds additional panels and help us fulfill our annual energy needs. Also on the fourth floor, I'd like to point out some of the electrical metering aspects that help us keep tabs on what's going on. All of the systems in the building are monitored by a specific meter. And what this does is it enables real-time output and analysis of energy use. So not only will this help determine what systems are operating at optimal levels, it'll also give the users, Phil and his group, a chance to modify their behavior to decrease energy use over time. People assume that lead requirements add a lot of cost. That actually turns out not to be the case. This building is a, perhaps a little bit more expensive than an equivalent more conventional one of similar size, but not dramatically so. Very important aspect of a project of this size and complexity is partnerships and interaction. And certainly the teamwork that went into this project has been extremely important in making it a reality. 
The differentiator on this project and making it a success was that the user, Phil and his group, were not only enthusiastic about sustainability and energy goals, but they were determined that this was going to be the most energy efficient building in the world. And we're not fortunate to work with clients of this nature often, if ever. This is an extremely rare opportunity. And it's what makes this building different. To have a client that not only is pushing the most advanced energy strategies in the world, but also is willing to monitor and meter their performance throughout the life of the building and modify their behavior as needed to achieve long-term energy goals is incredibly rare and incredibly impressive. All right, we're headed back toward the northeast staircase in the adjacent elevator, and we'll be heading back down so we can exit the building. We very much appreciate your listening and visiting, and you can find more information about the building's energy use and its efficiency features at the website go.ece.illinois.edu slash energy. Thank you for visiting.